in the last lecture we studied first order optimality conditions of constraint optimization in this lecture we will complete the discussion by considering second order conditions also first we discuss what is the lagrangian function and then we go to second order conditions this is the so called lagrangian function of an optimization problem so here what is being done is that with the objective function you add all the constraint functions with a multiplier okay so the multipliers lagrange multipliers lambda i corresponding to the equality constraints are here and similarly the lagrange multipliers corresponding to the inequality constraints are denoted as mu mu j okay so now what we have got here is a function of not only x but x lambda and mu that is earlier we were talking about lambdas and mu's as just values now they become variables and just like x we need their correct values for the optimality optimal point okay now this lagrangian function actually encodes everything related to a nonlinear optimization problem a constraint optimization problem the objective function equality constraints inequality constraints the variables of the problem here here and here and the lagrange multipliers here and here everything together you can put it like this using summation notation or you can use the matrix notation like this so this sum basically turns out to be lambda transpose h where lambda is a vector h is a vector similarly here okay now this is a very convenient mathematical artifact which uh, uh, makes a lot of discussion easier just like just in terms of lagrangian we will see how so the gradient condition of the kkt condition in the kkt conditions turn out to be simply the condition that grad l should be zero okay the gradient of l with respect to x because now we need to mention that actually that when we talk of the gradient of l we will be talking about the partial gradient with respect to x not bothering about the lagrange multipliers similarly with respect to lambda and mu you can separately construct other such partial gradients and the complete gradient if you take all the variables will be long having large number of entries right so if you differentiate this function this function with respect to x only then what you will get you will get rad f here and from here you will get sigma grad h i lambda i okay from here grad g j into mu j basically this in the vector notation from here if you will see okay and this is the gradient condition in the kkt conditions okay so basically that entire thing can be now very concisely said as gradient of l with respect to x is zero and <coughs> since since lambda and mu are now used for some variables then their correct values are denoted as lambda star mu star okay and this is the first order optimality condition other than mu star being greater than equal to zero okay now if you consider the derivatives with respect to the lambda that partial gradient 
like this the way we said red super subscript x you can say red red subscript lambda so if you differentiate it with respect to lambda then simply you will get hx and hx star equal to 0 is actually the feasibility condition <coughs> so it turns out that the lagrangian being stationary with respect to x is the condition of optimality and lagrangian being stationary with respect to lambda is the condition of feasibility okay now inactive constraints we are keeping out of this discussion and active constraints we are including with the equality constraints as usual okay inactive constraints can be kept out of this discussion because their mu j's are being mu j's are zero and so if they don't enter it at all then differentiation etc will not make very good sense with respect to that differentiation with respect to that so this is the first order up to first order how far lagrangian function goes then we will go for the second order later but before that look at what happens i mean this looking at this is important because after we say that uh, lagrangian is stationary with respect to x means optimality and stationary with respect to lambda means feasibility then there is a possibility of someone someone jumping to the conclusion that then rather than the objective function we try to minimize lagrangian with respect to x lambda everything together that's not right because with respect to lambda it will not be a minimum the solution point will not be minimum so at the optimal point the lagrangian is at a stationary point with respect to x x lambda etc however it's not a minimum point with respect to all the variables it's actually a saddle point if you look at this simple problem trivial problem actually <coughs> actually for this purpose it is not possible to bring a complicated problem at all because to show contours you can have at most two variables and one of those variables will be lambda so for x only one variable remains lambda or mu whatever it is so only one variable problem minimize x square subject to this okay so this means normally x square will be minimum at x equal to 0 but that is not feasible so at x equal to minus 2 you will get the solution now if you try to draw the contour of the lagrangian lagrangian in the x mu space x here mu here okay you will find that at the solution point you have a saddle point so at x equal to 2 and mu equal to 4 you have a saddle point and the value at the saddle point is 4 both the lagrangian value and the function value and if you try to check the contour of lagrangian one contour curve with, for which lagrangian has function value 4 that goes like this and this okay, crisscross and on this side and this side in these two sectors as you go far from the saddle point the lagrangian value decreases so in this direction the lagrangian is a maximum here on the other hand in this direction and in this direction as you go away from the saddle point the lagrangian value increases this way also it increases this way also it increases so in this direction the lagrangian is at a minimum point here so minimum along one direction maximum along the other direction so that's a saddle point so the lagrangian is a saddle point not only that the lagrangian is a function which will have a concavity with respect to the lagrange multipliers everywhere with respect to x whatever it may be okay. 
so this saddle point thing you have to keep in mind which will have its implication in later other in other discussions also okay. now we come to the second order in the case of gradient we found that for constraint optimization the uh, optimality etc were governed not by the gradient of the function but the gradient of the lagrangian in second order for the case of hessian also it is similar in constraint optimization compared to the hessian of the objective function it is more important to study the hessian of the lagrangian and hessian of the lagrangian will be what just take the expression of lagrangian differentiate it with respect to x twice throughout then you will have hessian of the objective function plus sigma lambda i into hessian of the hi constraint function plus sigma mu j into hessian of gj okay so now it's a huge hessian okay lots and lots of matrices are evaluated and added together now this hessian is considering the derivatives only with respect to x differentiation with respect to x only okay so you take the gradient with respect to x make a transpose of it and then each one of them you differentiate for each entry of that you get the gradient and organize them in columns so that is how you will get the hessian so this is what you have here now if you consider it with respect to x and lambda that is lagrange multiplier with respect to active lagrange multiplier corresponding to active constraints then you will get that hessian this hessian of the lagrangian as we have written here here and then grad x grad l grad lambda l transpose that is first differentiate with respect to lambda take transpose and then differentiate with respect to x that will come here in the opposite order when you do that is lambda x derivative then it will come here and lambda lambda derivative will come here you can put all those things here so this is actually this hl which we put here and what will be this and this you see if you take it's first if you take the derivative of the lagrangian with respect to lambda then you simply get h and then if you differentiate it with respect to x you will get grad h okay on the other hand if you first differentiate it with respect to uh, grad h transpose on the other hand if you differentiate it with respect to lambda then you have got hx and then next if you differentiate it with respect to lambda again then you will get zero right because hx is free from lambda so that is why you get grad h here and grad h transpose here and zero here check with the dimensions this is n by n this is n by m so it can sit beside it this is m by n so it can sit below hl it will fill the correct number of rows and this is zero matrix m by m size that makes sense because the differentiation is first with respect to m dimensional lambda and then again with respect to m dimensional lambda so this part of the hessian pure hessian with respect to lambdas okay the way this was with respect to xs so that is a zero matrix okay so active gjs and their mu js have appropriately taken in h and lambda now this is called the bordered hessian why because the usual hessian of the lagrangian which is here is here bordered with these first order derivatives okay. and this bordered hessian is also of some utility in several contexts in some books you will find the bordered hessian bordered hessian is written with the derivative with respect to lambda coming first derivative with respect to x coming later and then it will look like this okay so any of the notations can be used 
because whether you consider x first or lambda first in differentiation, it's up to you. Okay. So you can use either of the notations, but consistently. Okay. Now we come to the second order conditions. For a KKT point, the first order change in the function value along any feasible direction we have already found to be zero or positive. Now we can actually not only we can, we have to. We have to further check the second order change, which now becomes dominant if the first order change is zero. And the nature of the second order change will tell us whether it is a minimum point or not. Now, this check needs to be conducted primarily for the neighborhood in the surface, which has dimension n minus n. That surfaces, you remember, it, it's a intersection of all the constraint hypersurfaces, constraint manifolds. So together, whatever they produce as the intersection, in that surface only, you have got to move for visible points. The other feasible uh, points in the neighborhood, which are in the feasible cone, they are not very relevant for this discussion because those cases were settled at the first order level only. Because the moment mu j turns out to be positive, that means in the inward direction, leaving the present tangent space, if you go inward, then there is a decrease in the function value. So if there is a decrease in the first order itself, then you don't bother to conduct any second order analysis because neighborhood is settled at the first order. In the tangent space, in the first order, the change was zero. That is why we are checking the second order effect. Okay. So consider a curve now you have to check the second order change in the neighborhood in that surface, okay? So consider a curve Z, Z of T. T is a curve parameter. You can think of an ant moving with T as time, okay? Consider a curve Z T passing through the KKT point X star, which is Z of zero in the feasible surface. From KKT conditions, we know that d by dt of f of z of t, z of t operates as x, you see. So fx with t at evaluated at t equal to 0 turns out to be its derivative. How do you get? You get grad f at z t transpose z dot t, okay? Evaluated at t equal to 0. When you evaluate that at t equal to 0, you get this as a vector in the tangent space and z dot t will be a vector in the tangent space and this will be grad f x star. Okay, So this is equal to zero that has been already confirmed from the first order analysis for all z dot in the tangent space, all tangents in the tangent space. Okay, And therefore for all z t in the surface is because if you take zt in the surface, its tangent, its derivative will fall on the tangent subspace. Now we investigate the second order change. Second order derivative with respect to this scalar parameter t because it's a curve. Okay, this. So that will be what? You will take this and differentiate this whole thing once more and then put t equal to zero. So this whole thing, differentiate it once more and then put t equal to zero. So when you differentiate this whole thing, then actually this derivative goes from here to here on the overall thing, not only on this bracket. This bracket is actually used for only transpose. Now d by dt of this entire thing. So that will be derivative of this, which will be the Hessian into z dot, which comes as the transpose here. Okay, So z dot transpose Hessian into z dot, 
when you put t equal to zero, then here you get z dot zero. Here also you get z dot zero, and here in place of z zero you get x star. Plus there will be one more term. This thing kept as it is into z double dot, and that is here. Okay. Now this is the second order change. Now here we know that z dot. Is a vector in the tangent subspace, but this z double dot can be in any direction. We have no check on that. That will depend upon this curve z t, right? So what is its curvature? We have we do not have much details over that. And in fact, whatever we use the curvature with different rate of parameterization z t, they may show all sorts of directions. Okay. So we don't know what is that double dot. We have to get rid of it. The way to get rid of it is to consider a similar derivative of each constraint function, which is active. So take h i and get a derivative of that kind. Okay. So you get this whole thing, and this is zero. We know because if the curve z t remains on the surface. Then this, this differentiation, the domain of this differentiation, all these both derivatives will be on that surface only, and on that surface, h i is zero now, going to remain zero later also, okay, like this. So this derivative has to be zero because something is zero now and going to be later also zero. Wherever you go on that curve, because that curve is on the surface on which h i is zero anyway. So this second order derivative, any derivative for that matter, is zero. Now what we do? We multiply this whole thing with lambda i and add to this one. We are basically adding zero only, right? So it will not change anyway. So on this side, this zero into lambda i we add here. Which means no change, and this whole thing into lambda i, we add here, and that we do for every i, for every active constraint. If we go on doing like that, then what you will you will get? You will get here. These things will come and get added, and here you will get Hessian of the objective function plus lambda one into Hessian of h one plus lambda two into Hessian of h two, and so on. For all active constraints, so basically, in this expression here, you will get Hessian of the Lagrangian. Similarly, here, these fellows will come and get added with z double dot, right? So you will get here gradient of f plus gradient lambda i into gradient of h i for all i s that they will get added. So here you will get gradient of The Lagrangian. So all these zero fellows we multiply with corresponding Lagrange multipliers, add to this second order derivative, and get this. And this is how we have got rid of this unknown z double dot. Okay, because since it is a KKT point, this is already settled to be zero. Okay, so this intractable z double dot we have now. Cleared out. Okay, we have eliminated, and we have got this second order derivative, second order change, rate of change, as just this. So earlier it was h of f, and then there was something. So we have added things in such a manner that this whole thing adds up to zero and goes out of business. And here, by that by that time, we have actually assembled the entire Hessian of the Lagrangian. So we have got this, and this is something which we can talk about because this is a vector transpose a matrix into a vector, the same vector. Okay, so this is actually a quadratic form with z dot sitting here, which is a tangent vector in the tangent subspace. Okay, so from here we know that first order change was zero, second order rate of change. 
as long as this is non negative we can say that this can be a minimum point that is if it is a minimum point then this will be non negative on the other side you can say that if this is positive then it is a minimum point provided that kkt conditions are already satisfied so these two things give you necessary and sufficient conditions if x star is a minimum point then besides the kkt condition it turns out that this is non negative for every tangent vector for every d in the tangent space okay sufficient conditions you say that if x star satisfy now it is the other way around if x star satisfies the kkt conditions and also the second order condition d transpose hl x star into d is greater than 0 strict equality for all d in the tangent of space then x star is a minimum point okay so the difference between the necessary condition and the sufficient condition is just this inequality and strict inequality so the hessian of the lagrangian is now notice that when we said that this has to be greater than equal to 0 this has to be greater than 0 we did not talk about the hl being i mean this we did not say that for all d it has to be so we said for all d in the tangents of space it has to be so and that is a little twist so the hessian of the lagrangian is not required to be positive semi definite or positive definite its behavior in the tangent space should should be so so that is the essence of the condition so you say that the restriction of hl x star to the tangent space has to be positive semi definite for the necessary condition and positive definite for the sufficient condition that is if you take a vector in the tangent of space operate hl over that and whatever result you get if you project it back to the tangent of space to the to the same vector which you originally took d transpose hl into d so whichever tangent vector you took over which you operated hl the product may be out in whatever direction and then you project it back to that old direction from where you picked up okay so that restriction should be positive semi definite for necessary condition or positive definite for sufficient condition so this is the way it is now how to test that condition how to evaluate this restriction what can we get hold of in our hand which we should check as positive or non negative okay so that is done by the idea of the projected hessian basically to begin with we need a basis for all vectors in the tangent space so the tangent space is n minus m dimensional so basically we will need n minus m linearly independent solutions of this where a transpose is that h so you see that h transpose d equal to 0 is the description of the tangent space so this is m by n full rank matrix so you will have n minus m linearly independent solutions for this and you can find it out find them out i mean it's not a very difficult thing in fact if you take a transpose as m vectors for the normal space and then if you basically conduct a ramschmidt orthogonalization kind of process and one by one if you go on getting vectors which are all orthogonal to these fellows okay and among themselves linearly dependent independent then you would construct it so it is not very difficult to construct a, a complete solution of this system okay so and that complete solution will have n minus m linearly independent solutions so those linearly independent solutions for that when you construct a basis suppose those solutions are d1 d2 d3 etc up to dn minus m and then this gives you basis because these are linearly independent solutions so this is a basis for the tangent of space this matrix encoding the basis is of size n by 
n minus m because each of them is n dimensional vector and n minus one of n minus m of them are there now this basis need not be orthonormal but when you compute if you make them orthonormal that is going to make your life easier okay now for, for any vector d you can in in the tangents of space for which you need this positive semi definiteness positive definiteness so for any such vector you can work out a linear combination in terms of these right so what does that mean you can work out a unique vector w okay with these many entries n minus m entries such that that vector d is w1 into d1 plus w2 into d2 that is the meaning of basis right and that is this dw so that means between the set of all possible w's and the set of all tangent vectors all vectors in the tangent space there is a one to one correspondence and that is through this basis matrix d so you can express d as the direction as capital d into w for all w arbitrary w okay and then in that formula d transpose hld you put this capital d w so d transpose hld there in place of d you put capital d w so d transpose becomes w transpose d transpose h l sitting here here d w now leave out w transpose from here and w from here and in between whatever is there d transpose h l x star into d call that l m give it a name okay then you get w transpose l m w where l m is this and this l m is n minus m into n by n minus m by n minus m this is the projected hcm and now this has to be positive definite or positive semi definite for sufficient and necessary conditions for all w and that means they simply have to be positive semi definite positive definite as usual okay so the second order necessary condition is that this lm this matrix needs to be positive semi definite and the second order sufficient condition is that this lm is positive definite and checking which is much less task compared to the full n by n matrix which doesn't need to be positive definite for that matter so n minus m by n minus m dimensional matrix when when you try to check that as positive definite you basically check the silvester criteria the leading minors being all non negative or for positive definiteness you check them to be all positive okay now there is also an alternative test based on the bordered hessian okay this bordered hessian but that test is very complicated first of all the matrix is huge n plus m by n plus m okay because n are here only and then there are m more rows here m more columns here there is an m by m zero matrix sitting here now on this bordered hessian also there have has been a test developed people have developed a test so according to this for the sufficient condition for a kkt point to be a local minimum is that the last n minus m trailing minus trailing minus because we have written it like this of hb should be of the same sign and the last ones and that sign should be minus m to minus 1 to the power m that is if odd number of active constraints are there then all of these should be negative if even number of active constraints are there then all of them should be positive and then all of them which are they now you see the last n minus m trailing minus the first trailing minor will be the single zero at this corner the second trailing minor will be the 0000 by 2 trailing part that determinant okay the third leading minor would be similarly 3 by 3 segment so first m of them will be zero anyway because the matrix itself is zero and even after that the m plus 1th m plus 2th also will be zero that you will see if you try to put some numbers here and evaluate the determinants okay 
and up to 2m minus 1 they will all be zero and the 2m at 2m 2m by 2m minor from this end that will not be zero but that will be minus 1 to the power m into a positive number okay you can check that by expanding this in terms of numbers and see how it happens so these 2m minors we are not bothered about after that the remaining m min n minus m minors the last n n minus m the biggest ones okay so that is like this another bigger another bigger and finally the entire thing okay so all these minors should be of the same size because whatever sign the 2m by 2m guy got after that there should be no further sign change that then that is the sufficient condition for the kt point to be a minimum point okay you see if we remove the first n minus m minus 1 rows okay that means n minus m but 1 So that means from here, two m plus one by two m plus one will remain. Okay, so that is the first trailing minor in this sequence. Second one, and that will be that will have size this. For the second one, you will remove the leading n minus m minus two rows and columns, and so on. And then you will get two m two m plus two by two m plus two. And so on. This should be two m plus three by two m plus three, and as you go on, final one will be two m plus n minus m, which is m plus n, m plus n by m plus n, which is the full thing. Okay. In the last round, this should be next one, two m plus three. Okay. So in the last round, you will get the full thing. So these many minors under question you can get from that border Hessian. and if all of them are of the same sign sign minus m minus 1 to the power m then it's a minimum point now as it happens this bordered hessian test turns out to be equivalent to the projected hessian test if you write a case say you take symbolically do not have to put numbers if you write say um, three dimensional x and one active constraints or two active constraints and write down the whole thing and work out work it out then you will find that the border hessian test whatever it wants to be positive or negative if the projected hessian test succeeds then all of them will be positive or negative as according to order so the two tests are actually equivalent now the logic of the projected hessian test was direct on the other hand the derivation or proof of the border hessian test in the most general case is very very cumbersome it uh, goes on I mean, uh, determinant expansions are always quite dirty okay so besides the computational cost of a border hessian test even if you believe it or you prove it you derive it once and say okay now i believe that it is correct then for any particular case numerically if you try to evaluate then you see the border hessian test requires you to compute these many determinants of size this 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 quite big okay and that is too high compared to what the projected hessian test wants you projected hessian test also wants you to evaluate n minus m determinants but they are so small it requires an n minus m dimensional matrix n minus m by n minus m dimensional matrix to be positive definite okay so by sylvester's sylvester's criterion you will test the leading minors one by one so the first one is just a scalar one by one second one is 2 by 2 3 by 3 and so on the final one will be n by m by n by n as also so little okay. so compared to a projected hessian test which we studied earlier which was straight forward which we derived actually the border hessian test is enormously cumbersome computationally also therefore 
you may never need to actually conduct the border addition test. Okay. Here also I mentioned it only for the record, so that later somewhere if you see that, you should not get tense. You should recall that your teacher told you that this is actually equivalent to the projected Hessian test for which we have got the proper derivation and proof and we trust it. The bordered Hessian itself, not this test, but the bordered Hessian itself appears in some algorithms in some applications. Now we take an example to see how it operates. Say we try to minimize this function. This is a problem. Minimize this function subject to this is a constraint. Okay. So this is a problem. One, two variables, what constraint active? Only one constraint in the problem. Now from the first order analysis, we get grad f is this, grad h is this. And therefore, the grad L equal to zero, that condition will be this plus lambda times this equal to zero. And when you solve this with this constraint equation, you get these as two pairs of KKT points. Okay. You should verify it at leisure. So this is one pair of KKT points at top and bottom okay, with X one zero and then another pair of KKT points with left and right at left and right with y coordinate that is x2 coordinate to be zero. <clears throat> now, now you have got four KKT points and we want to conduct the second order analysis. So you will develop the HL, you differentiate this with respect to x1, get this, differentiate this with respect to x2 which is zero and so on. So you get this HL. Now at this first pair, when you evaluate this HL, you get this. And for this first pair, as you construct the tangent subspace, this is a normal space. In 2D space, one direction is for normal. So only one direction for tangent remains. So when you can put zero something, then you get here zero something. So it's orthogonal direction will be something zero and that is this. So then you construct a D transpose HLD. Now this matrix turns out to be one by one. Okay, because two minus one is one and this is positive. So it is a minimum point. So both of these will be minima with this Lagrange multiplier value. Similarly, when you test this, this pair, you get the HL as this the tangent space as this and therefore d transpose hl d as minus six and that is negative so it's not a minimum point so as simple as this okay of course for in this case n minus m was one so this matrix lm turned out to be one by one so in other cases it will be different but typically it will be less because it is n minus m okay number of variables minus number of active constraints that will be the size of that matrix LM. So now for this little problem, even border Hessian test will not be difficult because it will be three by three. And that single matrix three by three, but here it is a single number. So you have to test this determinant sign of the three by three matrix. You should conduct this border Hessian test for this case and satisfy yourself that for this the in this at this pair the bordered hessian determinant should turn out to be negative because its sign should be minus 1 to the power m and m is 1 here okay so in this case it will turn out to be negative and in this case it should turn out to be positive okay. so you should check that and as you check that, you will find that it will turn out to be actually minus one to the power m into whatever appears in this into something positive. You can actually open it up to that extent. Okay. 
So that shows you that the two tests are equivalent. Now, there is one special case of something called a weakly active inequality constraint. And what is that? We have earlier talked about constraints being active and inactive. Now we are going to talk about if it is active, then it can be strongly active or weakly active. Now let us see what. At a KKT point, an active constraint is called strongly active if the corresponding Lagrange multiplier is non zero. And it is called weakly active if it is zero. It makes good sense. It is strongly active if it is non zero. That means the there was some effort to satisfy the constraint. Okay. If the Lagrange multiplier value is zero, that means the constraint is satisfied, but it was effortlessly satisfied. No? So effortlessly satisfied means what? Means there was no conflict between the feasibility and optimality. In order to keep it feasible, you did not have to pull the solution to the constraint surface the optimal solution was anyway appearing there. That is why the lambda or mu turned out to be zero. For example, in this case, anyway, the minimum of this will turn out to be at x equal to zero. You did not have to pull it because of this constraint. Okay. So it is just, uh, incidentally becoming active because this happened to just fall there. Okay. So that is a sense of weakly active. Now, while deriving the second order conditions, we conveniently left aside the feasible direction in the feasible cone on of active inequality constraints with the understanding that they were already settled. But they were settled only for those cases which were either equality constraints or because in equality constraints, you cannot go along the normal in either direction or in the inequality constraints for those constraints, it was settled for which mu turned out to be positive. If mu turned out to be negative zero, then we don't know the way the second order change will come because the first order change was zero actually not positive in the inward side. Okay. So if mu were positive, then you would know that inward, if you move, the first order change will be uh, positive. Okay. Now we don't know that because first order change is zero in that direction. So then the second order change in that direction becomes important. Okay. So this understanding would be wrong in the special case where the constraint was active but mu j star also turned out to be zero. So in that case, leaving that out was not a good idea. So for the remedy, what you do is that for any inequality constraint for which mu j turned out to be zero, when you conduct the second order analysis, you consider that constraint for the time being as inactive. Okay. You drop it from the active set so that it stops restricting the tangent space to by one more dimension. Okay. And then this grad GJ direction will be included in the tangent space for this particular analysis. And the way tangent vectors are analyzed, this also will be analyzed. So the effective tangent space will grow by a dimension, including this direction, which has to be explored. And then along with the genuine tangent space, the second order analysis will be carried out as usual. Okay. So that you should do for every undecided direction. Okay. And undecided directions are marked by this zero value. Okay. So this is what we do up to second order conditions. Now, you might notice that as in the case of unconstrained optimization, there is a little gap of indecision between the necessary and sufficient second order conditions. And that is when this matrix is positive semi-definite, not positive definite. That is when all the eigenvalues of this turn out to be turn out to be positive, 
and some turn out to be zero. Then you don't know whether it is really a minimum or not. So for that, I mean, such situation doesn't arise very often. Okay. So one really needs to bother about a minimality analysis in higher dimension. But if needed, you can do it. Okay. You isolate that tangent vector or those tangent vectors along which this fellow has zero eigenvalue and conduct a third order or higher order analysis by third order or fourth order directional derivative along those specific tangent directions. The way we did in general for unconstrained optimization problem. Okay. Now, why such opportunities arise very rarely or typically don't arise? The reason is that objective function and constraints are usually independent. And such a thing happening will require a tremendous amount of alignment, very unlikely kind of alignment between the objective function and the constraints. And that is why normally you don't find such situations. Okay. So that is why further higher order analysis, we typically never get an opportunity to conduct. Okay, so in summary, let us remember the important points. Uh, first, the Lagrangian function and its derivatives are crucial in the theory and algorithms of constraint optimization. And the second order necessary and sufficient conditions appear in terms of the nature of the eigenvalues of the projected Hessian. Restriction of the Hessian of the Lagrangian to the tangent surface. Still higher order analysis is possible, but most of the time not needed. Okay. So therefore, second order analysis is more or less complete. So this is the point where we stop here. And in the next lecture, we will discuss the tremendously interesting topic of convex programming which has a lot of beautiful properties. Okay. So for the time being, we stop here. Thank you.